I'm Dan Drake. This is Front Up on Visitor Network TV, uh, where our guest today is Peter Boyce. Peter, welcome. Thank you, Dan. Glad to be here. Peter is a, uh, a scientist by training and by nature, uh, and has been uh, involved in a number of projects recently involving the harbor and uh, base scallops. And one of the things that he has done over the last seven years or so is do a dive survey of the harbor. Peter, do you want to talk about that a little bit? But I think before you do, I better give you a, disc a journalist disclaimer that I am president of the Nantucket Shellfish Association, which has funded a good deal of the research you've done. Yes, and uh, of course I'm on the board right. of the association. Mm -hmm. Well, we uh, started, um, the Mariah Mitchell Association started uh, this dive survey in 2006 mm -hmm. and was funded by the Environmental Protection Agency. And uh, when their funding dried up, the funding for our uh, project also died up. Mm -hmm. But it's a fairly massive project. We looked at 48 sites in the harbor. We do a dive every September on those uh, sites. And I think you had a, a picture there that shows we really cover the whole harbor. And I think that's an important, uh, it's an important point. And uh, so we measure the amount of eelgrass, we measure the coverage for different kinds of algae, we uh, measure uh, the scallops, and we do uh, this with a scientific transect. So we take 25 square meters at the bottom and count every piece of eelgrass and every scallop and every crab in those 25 meters. And what's the overall purpose of this? The overall purpose is to establish some kind of uh, a baseline and look for trends in uh, the harbor, whether we're losing eelgrass or whether uh, there are more uh, predators one year than another, things like that, to try to monitor what's going on with our harbor. Because if we don't know what's going on with our harbor, we can't tell if the things we're doing to try to help it along are having any effect whatsoever. So that's the point. In 2008, you made a discovery of something new in the harbor, right? Yes. 2008, there was uh, an invasive algae from the Far East, which has been had been transported somehow to the uh, uh, Massachusetts area. And it's now prevalent all up and down the East Coast, of course. And it's called Lingbia, L-Y-N-G-B-Y-A. And uh, it's uh, really uh, a very bad invasive uh, species. In 2007, when we looked at the harbor, as you can see, every one of the sites around here um, is green, which means that we found no Lingbia. So in 2007, we had no Lingbia in the harbor. And it first started in 2008. It first started in 2008. And by the time we got to 2012. By 2012, <laughs> we had uh, over 90% coverage in a large number of sites around the harbor. And to show you what, uh, what I mean by 90% coverage is this it completely covers the eelgrass. It makes it impossible for the sunlight to get to the eelgrass. And we think that it's uh, really having a detrimental effect on the eelgrass. This is a picture of what it looks like on the bottom. Right? Is that 90% coverage? That's 90% coverage. Yeah. You can see a few blades of eelgrass. I don't know if they show up on the camera. And that was taken in September uh, 2012. So. So, again, you say the, the impact of this is on the eelgrass. That's correct. Why is eelgrass important? Let's go back. And well, start. the eelgrass is important because uh, that's where the baby scallops go to hang out for their first few months mm -hmm. of uh, their life. They climb up. Actually, they have a little foot, and they can uh, inch themselves up like a snail does to the tops of the eelgrass blades keeps them out of reach of the crabs that are uh, stuck on the bottom and can't swim. So it's very important. It's important for striped bass. It's important uh, where they're, because there they come in, they lay their eggs, and the young bass babies uh, hang out in the eelgrass to keep them safe from predators. 
So, so it's a, a very important part of the whole thing, the, the whole environment. So again, going back to 2006, 2007, this is a chart of the eelgrass coverage. Yes, on very in various places in the harbor. Right, starting at 2006, and I think the important thing to to look at here is the slow. Well, two things are important. The, One is there's a slow. Uh, downward trend. This blue line here is the head of the harbor. Um, the next line is the third bend. The yellow line down here is the head of the harbor, which already has less coverage than mm -hmm. uh, sites farther down the harbor, and it's going down. Um, and then the only place that where the eelgrass seems to be holding its own is on Hussey Shoal, which is the center of the, uh, it's just outside the anchorage in the town mm -hmm. basin. So, um, but the real thing that I noticed in 2013, if you hold that up again, Dan, is every one of the sites has a downward trend in 2013. Otherwise, so, it sort of fluctuates a bit. That's right. And, and so, this last chart, shows the change from year to year. That's right. Um, if there's more eelgrass at a given site, and these are all the individual sites that uh, had a lot, eel, sufficient eelgrass to make sense of, um, in 2006, we had a number of green sites that uh, had more eelgrass than the year before. Actually, this is 2007. In 2008, it turns red, so we lost eelgrass. 2009, um, it's pretty evenly distributed. Same 2010, 2011, 2012. But then in 2013, when you compare it to 2012, every site but two lost eelgrass. And this is the first time we've seen such a red stripe like that indicating that every site in the harbor is losing the eelgrass. And that's, that's a red flag warning. That red stripe there should warn us all that the harbor is under attack by this invasive algae. And, uh, and the invasive algae is cutting off the sunlight and the eelgrass is having a hard time growing and so we're losing our eelgrass at an unprecedented rate. Do we have any sense of why there was such a dramatic change from 2012 to 2013? No, we haven't, uh, we, we're not clear why that's happened. Um, the one thing that is important is that there is uh, the algae needs nitrogen to grow. That's the algae food. Mm -hmm. And so when we have nitrogen, high nitrogen in the water, then you can e expect to have much more algae growing. And that may be what's happening. We don't have uh, uh, the uh, nitrogen numbers yet for the, uh, last year. Mm -hmm. So we can't tell um, whether the fluctuations in nitrogen is what's causing this. But uh, whatever, uh, whatever's happening, something is happening, and it's, it should be a red flag warning to us. So you'll be diving again this uh, September. We'll dive again this September, and we're hoping against hope that the it's a was a one year thing, mm -hmm. and that maybe some of the things we're doing to uh, help mitigate the nitrogen in the water are having some effect, and that this was a one year thing, and we'll begin to recover some of the eelgrass. There are two things that we've been doing, are, are there not? And the town has been doing and, and the community has been doing in order to mitigate the nitrogen problem in the harbor? Right, well the first thing is uh, Richard Ray has gone around and inspected all of the uh, septic systems. So that we have, uh, especially near the water, we have um, ensure that we have working septic mm -hmm. systems and that's very important. Uh, although a septic system does not take out a lot of nitrogen. But if it's not working, 
then every night a bit of nitrogen goes into it, goes right through into the groundwater, mm -hmm. and then through our sandy soil, and within a week, it's in our harbor. And that's the problem that we face. So, but the, we have been trying that. We've been trying something else on the fertilizer the front. The second of thing is the uh, fertilizer. We spent uh, three or four years on the fertilizer committee, the Article 68 work group, and came up with uh, a modern set of best practices of mm -hmm. what to do for the fertilizer. And this year we're requiring the commercial landscapers the town to, is to be licensed. Yeah, the town, the town is, is re right. requiring that, yes. Um, who, uh, anybody who applies fertilizer commercially. Has to have a license. Right. And in order to get a license, they have to go through a class of how and when to apply fertilizer, how much to use, and so forth. So, uh, so we have a problem. We, are, we don't know the extent of it yet, but it appears to be growing more serious. Is that a that's, fair summary? That's a, a perfect summary. And uh, we've just started doing this eight-year analysis. Mm. Um, next, we'll add to it, of course, this year and have nine years of data so we can really draw some uh, good conclusions. And uh, during the course of the summer, we're going to be investigating in our data, what might be causing the what might have caused the 2012 bloom, mm -hmm. if we can if we can identify it. Um, so, what do we take away from this? What is what are the what are the lessons that we, as ordinary citizens, if you will, can can uh, uh, well we use to to help the situation. What we, what we have to do is just starve the algae. We've got to take away, the, the best thing that we can do is to take away the nitrogen, take mm. away what it eats. And uh, there are, I'd say there are three takeaways. One is to uh, follow the fertilizer best practices. Don't apply it too early, don't apply it too late, and don't apply it all at once. Let me interrupt you for a moment. The landscapers have been trained, but homeowners who do their own fertilizing right. have not been trained. That's correct. How, where, can they, is there a place they can go to get information on what these best practices are? Um, there's a best practices manual up on the web. Uh, we're going to... Where? We, where, what, where? Whoa. Uh, oh, sorry, the town website, the town website under the Natural Resources Department. Uh, department. And uh, that's a big, long manual. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the first steps that needs to be taken is to, and, and I think uh, various organizations are thinking about how to do this effectively, is to condense it into uh, something well, you, simple. That you, are, you had three things there. You said what? That's, that's the big, uh, yeah. yeah, that's the major What were those part. three things again? Don't apply it too early. Don't apply it before April 15th. Mm. The grass isn't growing mm. yet. It doesn't take up the nitrogen, and the rain washes it through into mm. the groundwater, and then it's in our harbor. Mm -hmm. Don't apply it too late. After uh, October 15th, um, the grass is going to sleep for the winter. It's not taking in nutrients because mm. it's no longer growing. So anything you apply at the end of the season, uh, doesn't get used very mm -hmm. effectively mm -hmm. and gets washed through. And no, the, uh, the recommendation is no more than three pounds of nitrogen per thousand square feet. The, the recommendation is don't apply it all at once. Mm -hmm. the, ca the grass can't take it up fast enough before the next rainstorm. And so it washes into the groundwater and it's in our harbor. So those are the three major things. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can do other things like uh, cut the grass longer so it has better roots, so it takes up more of this nitrogen that you're putting on it. Um, leave the grass clippings on. They're equivalent to a pound of nitrogen mm -hmm. per thousand square feet. And reduce the amount of free nitrogen you, you put in. You mean in turn there as a substitute for fertilizer? As a substitute for fertilizer. Oh, no. okay. The more clippings you leave on the lawn, the greener it's going to be. Uh, what so else, things, what, things what else like can that. we do? So the second thing then is keep your septic system working. And that means that you need to add bacteria at, at the beginning of the season. If it's been lying dormant for the winter, the bacterial colony, which makes the septic system work and takes up at least part of the nitrogen, is dead. 
because it hasn't been fed all winter. So put more bacteria in and uh, there are, uh, the Marine Home Center has plenty of uh, uh, things that you can put in your septic system, flush down the toilet to enhance it. There's a school of thought that you can also use just plain baker's yeast. That's right, you're absolutely right. So uh, anything you do to help uh, mm. make the bacteria grow before you really start using the septic system it is very, very helpful. And the third thing that I think we can do is enlist your neighbor's cooperation. Mm -hmm. Talk to your neighbor about it. If you're watching this show and you've seen the results of uh, what happens uh, when you have too much nitrogen in mm -hmm. the water, um, it's, it's pretty frightening. And pass that message on and get them to cooperate in this. Isn't it true, just in, to wrap up here, that we've known for a long time that we have too much nitrogen in our harbor, but that this is the first time that we've really had an identifiable threat, a specific identifiable threat that feeds on the nitrogen, on the excess nitrogen, and, and is therefore in that, its own way having a negative impact on the harbor. That's right. There are, there are two invasive sets of invasive algae mm -hmm. which have come in uh, in the last yeah. decade or mm -hmm. so. One is this lingbia, lingbia, which makes the big black mats. Mm -hmm. And if you were here in 2012 and remember the stuff washing up on the beaches, it's not a pleasant sight mm -hmm. to go swimming in. The uh, other is, of course, the cochlidinium algae, which causes the rust tide blooms, which we've had the mm -hmm. last couple of years as well. Well, Peter, thank you very much for helping us uh, raise this warning flag for providing the information that we need to, to really get people to focus on it. Well, thanks, Jane. And uh, I'm sure there'll be more to come on this subject. I, I'm, I'm certainly glad to help, and I, I do have this... Uh, project that we've talked mm -hmm. about today has some good news sides, which maybe we can talk about uh, some, some other time. time. <laughs> Great. Thank you Thank very you much, so Peter much. Boyce. You're quite welcome, Dan. <laughs>